If you are a fan of 80s action movies, then definitely check out the Kickstarter campaign for my first feature length documentary, In Search of the Last Action Heroes. The film charts the rise and fall of the 1980s action movie genre. We'll reveal behind the scenes footage, exclusive insights and uncover stories never told before by the people behind one of the most iconic eras in cinema. We can only make this project happen with your support, so come and join me on this adventure back in time. Check out the link to our Kickstarter page and discover exclusive limited edition rewards in the description below. Okay guys, well welcome to this roundtable discussion of the action field tropes that we all know and love. Uh, I'm Ty Singh, I'm going to be hosting this roundtable discussion. I'm the founder of the Bristol Bad Film Club and author of the upcoming book born to be bad talking to the greatest action villains in uh actually talking to the greatest villains in action cinema i can't even get the title of my own book right um <laughs> i thought before we dive into uh some of our favorite tropes of action films we could just go around the table and uh introduce um ourselves uh, give a little bit of background about our youtube channels so i thought first up rossitron if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I run Rossitron, and it's a, I guess, video essay channel, uh, which is kind of a term I'm not a super big fan of, but anyway, um, talking about action films pretty much, sometimes other stuff, but generally just looking at the biggest of action cinema, which strangely has probably the least amount of video essay stuff looking at it, even though they're arguably the most technical side of things. So that's what I do. Cool. Uh, Mr. H? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, well, I don't know really. I, my YouTube channel kind of started as anything and everything. I just talk about what I enjoy um, and has recently moved into interviewing people uh, and attending press screenings for things, which is a, a wild ride in and unto itself. So, <laughs> yeah, just just what I like, basically. That's literally it. Cool. Ryan? Uh, hi, I'm Ryan, and uh, I genuinely don't know how I got here. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, like like Rossitron, I, uh, I, yeah, people would call what I do video essays, even though I kind of dispute the term myself. Uh, I kind of just blabber about uh, films that I find interesting and sort of try to be more personal and reflective in that sense, uh, mostly focusing on uh, horror-related content because that seems to be the bizarre stuff that I'm into. That's about it, really. And finally, Oliver. Hello. Yes, my name's Oliver Harper. I produce retrospective reviews on 80s and 90s movies. So I cover, uh, of course, you cover a movie and I cover the visual effects of a film, the soundtrack, uh, the video games, if there was any available, and sort of give my own critique on it and open and end each retrospective with the trailer as well. So it's kind of everything about that one movie is kind of put into one big package. And I've been doing that since late 2011. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in full transparency, I am one of the writer-producers on Oliver's uh, forthcoming documentary film In Search of the Last Action Heroes, but that just means that, like all of you, I love 80s action films. So what I thought we could do is look at the most popular aspects, some might call them cliches of the action genre, and then we could go around the table and kind of discuss what our favourite of those are. So I thought we'd kick off with action heroes themselves our favorite action actors and in your opinion what makes a true action star is it someone like jackie chan who can do all their own fight scenes and their all their own stunts is it charisma like bruce willis used to have or is it someone like Arnie <laughs> who is just a massive man mountain so ryan what what's your take what do you think makes a great action star um, so like generally like my feelings about it is that there's sort of at least in the act uh, in the 80s there was kind of like a, a balance between those sort of like uh, pseudo bravado fantasy meets some form of like humanity and something that's kind of relatable um, I was kind of debating this with myself as to like who would be uh, I would consider a great action star and uh, the one that always comes to mind to me personally is Sorgoni Weaver as uh, Ellen Ripley I think in the in the Alien films Purely because there's sort of like a, it's not just so much this whole like badassery that everybody uh, like pop culture seems to sort of paint on uh, characters in the 80s, but there's sort of like a an, an integral like relatability and, and there's even a sense of weakness to her that's kind of, uh, you know, overcome gradually. I mean, I think the transition from when Ridley Scott did Alien, uh, did Alien to when James Cameron did Aliens and like 
putting her from a horror context into an action context, I feel like allows the it justifies her growth uh, in in like a very deep narrative context, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's where I would start. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, what do you reckon? What do you think makes a great action star? Well, usually the key is charisma, I think. Um, with every, with all these action stars we've had, like Arnold and Dolph and uh, Van Damme, there's always one little element that kind of sells them to the to the to the audience. Um, I mean, you, you could say, I mean, Arnold was like you know the best kind of action star, but for me, it's it's always I look at like Kurt Russell as Jack Burton in Big Trouble in Little China, where he's he's he thinks he's the hero and he's an absolute bozo, but extremely likable and. But he knows his limitations. He kind of figures them out, and um, I think by the end he kind of realizes his skill set. So, um, but there's, there's so many different combinations of what could make the sort of the best action star. But it's it's with Van Damme. You know, most action stars they always had a limitation with their acting ability, but there's always something about their physique or their martial arts skills that ends up selling them. But um, yeah, I'd probably say Jack Burton's probably the one. Even though he doesn't have any martial arts skills, he's just Kurt Russell with a wicked mullet <laughs> and attitude. Mr. H, where do you stand? Ah, uh, well, I mean, I I was debating this uh, when I kind of received the questions, and, and I think both of you have really valid points, in fact. Uh, and and my character, well, one of my picks would be similar to Ryan's, but it would be Kurt Russell in The Thing. Not typically someone you would look at and go, oh, it's an action hero, but someone who progresses through the film, you know, in that kind of way and, and has somewhat of a development but then i also second uh oliver with you know the likes of charisma and arnold schwarzenegger it's it's undeniable but it's more linked specifically to the 80s you know when you think about the 80s and you think about 80s action it is those people which you know had the overblown personas and that kind of cheesy charisma those are the people who generally speaking would instantly come to mind so i guess a blend arnold schwarzenegger plus you know, a little bit more of a, a subdued action hero like Kurt Russell in the thing. And Rossitron, what what for you springs to mind when you think of your your typical eighties action heroes? Um, well, I mean, again, like I'm following a lot of the points I agree with, but I guess one of the things I always found interesting with these actors that come to mind, even starting with someone like Sigourney Weaver, and then you go to Bruce Willis or even Schwarzenegger, arguably in a way is that they, they're known for these big, dumb action movies, but they all started in very serious stuff, pretty serious stuff. Like, even Conan or something like that was still, like, dark, high fantasy. And, you know, Stallone came from the Rocky films and was Oscar-nominated, and then Rambo was this small, intimate kind of thriller, and Alien is this really high-class horror movie. And they were sort of proven people before they took on the more arguably dumb look because they sort of in a way they have that charisma but they know themselves you know it's that knowing sense that they took on you know knowing what people find funny kind of what the rock does now probably a Mm. little bit more where they they just really knew what audiences wanted to see which was nothing they had to think about too much even though they were very capable of actors as actors of being able to make people think a lot and do things that were a bit deeper but they sort of cottoned on to this very simple idea and that for me is what it is is just knowing that the people on the set were have looked like they're having fun in these movies, look like they're enjoying themselves, and they never went too far, which kind of encapsulates a lot of the 80s action stuff, which the 90s obviously changed a bit and went a lot more serious and kind of crime drama-esque. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that would be it for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Those are some really great points. So I think what we've got here is a kind of a mixture of the the charisma and the people who are out of their depth and have that kind of emotional depth like Sigourney and Kurt Russell to see you through but another big element of the action films is of course the action itself whether it's the car chases the the explosions or the stunts so if we start with you Rossitron this time what is the definitive 80s action scene that comes to mind is it like the tanker chase in Terminator 2 is it Bill Duke picking up the chain gun in Predator and leveling half a forest. Well, if we're talking about 80s films, I'm going to go for Terminator 1. Um, and say, for me, Tech Noir, the gunfight. 
<laughs> so in terms of we're talking both 80s iconography and also just pure filmmaking quality and the excitement and what it means to it. And honestly, I'm going to talk about Terminator 1 a lot because I, it's like my <laughs> favorite film of all time. Um, but just what Cameron did with that in terms of even just using music and like what the song choice meant. Um, I can't burning on the in the third degree and like what that means to the character and stuff and then how it blends into this very thumping score and the fact that it's called tech noir and the neon and it was almost like he knew what would become very 80s but he was in the 80s sort of like back to the future in that way like choosing things specifically of the time that would age very quickly but also appear very retro it was it was just incredibly well and the scene is just so brilliantly well done and thrilling and gripping that i just love it cool i i completely agree the terminator is personally one of my favorite films and i prefer it to terminator 2 even though it's great in its own right but mr h where do you stand Ah, uh, well oh well you'll, you'll probably hear me bleed on about predator quite a lot in this <laughs> uh, but it's actually the scene where they all go into the uh, gorilla camp and just when arnold picks up the uh, the the motor which is being used as a generator or, or or something along those lines, that whole scene, how it's choreographed, everything it, it's it's just so good. It's it's got everything you you could need: cheese, just brutal masculinity, but to a, well again an ultimate cheesy level. It's just fantastic. I absolutely love that. It's really it's it's definitive for me. Okay, and uh, Oliver, what do you reckon? See, I could I could do an easy one to say the ending of Commando, but you know because that is like then whenever you think of that sort of classic eighties thing, you just think of one guy with you know with with, with like a, with the biggest guns with endless ammo just taking on every guy without being <laughs> without being hurt, you know. So I don't know. That's that's probably one of the most iconic kind of things that pops in always pops into my head. But I, I'm gonna have to be really you know repeat myself again with like Big Tom and Little China because it was. It was seeing that sort of the back alley fight scene when they you got the two guys kind of chase, you know, they, they face each other off, the two factions, and they charge in and, and fight. And it's like, at the time, seeing that, because that was like 86, that was. So seeing that kind of Hong Kong cinema th- style thrown into US, you know, theatrical movie was, a, you know, a big surprise to most people. And then you've got the three storms turn up and it's out of the blue. I mean, it's always amazing visual effects. So, and it doesn't involve any guns, only a little bit near the beginning. So seeing that all happen, you know, was it always kind of stuck in my mind as a kid. And um, yeah, I'd probably say that, but I mean, I would, you know, if, if pushed, I'll probably say Commando at the end, even though it's, it's more, it's more <laughs> comical than say the stuff in Predator, because Predator is like, you know, as other guys said, was like it's far that that stuff's far more polished. Where Commando is a little bit more loose around the edges, but it's you know I think it gets the points for just being so so over the top. So so far we have essentially a triple hat trick for the Austrian Oak. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, are you, are you going to make it uh, a, a full a full house? Literally all of them that are mentioned are the ones that are kind of always coming to mind to me. You see, so <laughs> it's 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 interesting when uh, Ro- uh, Ross brought up the uh, techno art scene from the Terminator. That was the one that that I wanted to point out because, you see, when I when I thought of Commando because that is the thing sort of the go to answer because it is the definitive. I feel like it is sort of that definitive cheesy spectacle of the eighties where it's like the 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 hero can't be harmed. He's somehow invincible and he's yeah, able yeah. to never run out of ammo. He's it's a video game effectively. And but it's it's interesting. I watched that and I think it was a few years later than when Predator came out. And I've always perceived Predator. I think like kind of quite a few people is that it's it's more. Of, I felt like it was a satire of what Arnie's films really were. And there's a scene, there's the scene where in Predator where they're like, where the, the guy picks up the minigun and they just literally mow down a forest of nothing because they think <laughs> they see it. I felt like that entire thing was a whole play on, on you know, how that invincibility is now kind of being dismantled for them because the scene that the, the scene that the Predator opens to where they are basically attacking this, um, the whole, the, the, the army base uh, or the, the, the guerrilla camp or whatever or whatnot. And, then they're just invincible lobbing grenades and they're like pinpoint accuracy and and they just walk out with not a sweat on them with their you know with the flex in their muscles and then predator comes in and kind of says well i'll prove you all wrong here and it kind of dismantles what the, they're sort of that pr- sort of bravado macho unstoppable action hero but the thing about the tech noir scene in um 
Terminator was like I I I, I think uh, as you're saying, Ty, about um, I view Terminator as superior to Terminator Two purely from the point of view of Terminator feels like almost like a borderline horror movie at times. With mm. the action feels with there's a weight to it. There's there's a sense of like there's a sense of urgency and like long, like like there's an impact to it in that everything's abrupt there's like an intimacy to it there's a sense of like this 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 has this has consequences it feels like like there's an under it, it creates an unpredictability it creates some sort of realism and i think when you're you see the scene where he uh, arnie's car uh, where arnie's terminator is just determined to get uh, to get sarah connor and it's his expression and all i feel sells that sort of like this this guy has an agenda and it it really it just adds an intensity that you know, it doesn't feel soft. It doesn't feel toned down. It feels that every death matters. Every every bullet matters. Everything that that happens from here on out is is going to matter in the long term. Absolutely. Plus the civilians getting caught in the crossfire. Exactly. As well. But from the the weight of those scenes to the levity, I feel this might be another Arnie Strong round. <laughs> the one-liners, the iconic one-liners, as the hero finishes off the bad guy or the big henchman or gets himself out of that last minute uh clinch let's go around the table what are your favorite action hero one-liners or they could be delivered by the villain diplomatic immunity is on the table gentlemen <laughs> let's start with uh, oliver see i was gonna say let off some steam bennett but i i i think go in pieces asshole with um dark yeah. angel yeah. where Dolph Lundgren shoots a guy at the end and he just says, go on peace, asshole, and he all explodes. I thought, that is brilliant. That's, you know, pure Dolph as well. So I'm going with that. So Dark Angel, that's yeah. that's a black sheep. I wasn't expecting some uh, Dolph Lundgren action. Ryan, what about you? Debating this one still. Um, oh, I'm going to go with the one from Scarface, which is say hello to my little friend. Uh, it's just... It's clean, simple. It's symbolic of everything he's went through. Uh, and that's me trying to be as profound as possible with my answer. Because <laughs> I'm, fam- I'm not as familiar with one-liners. <laughs> okay, no problem. Rossitron? Uh, I was debating this hard, but I think for me, it's got to be Roddy Piper. And oh. I have come here to chew bubblegum <laughs> oh, and one. kick ass God, and I'm all out of bubblegum. Because I just love nice. that film. Even though I think it deconstructs a lot of the 80s stuff and like it also is so perfectly encapsulated and i just love that line yeah uh, he, that is a man who has gone too soon uh mr h your favorite action movie one-liner oh, well um i think uh, again i was debating this and you almost had me when you were saying it's going to be be another round to the austrian oak but <laughs> one which i think would sum up 80s action films on a whole would be jesse ventura i ain't got time to bleed <laughs> uh, because it's, it's bravado it's cheese it's funny but it just plays into everything that you know the, the film was about and and it again just encapsulates 80s action films for me i think it has everything in that one line absolutely speaking about predator uh we've got a new predator film coming out this year uh hollywood loves a franchise often they can flog <laughs> them to death uh <laughs> Some might say a lot of our favorite franchises have gone on for far too long, whether it's The Terminator, Lethal Weapon, Aliens, Predator, and some should be put out to pasture. So for you guys, which franchise do you feel has gone on too long or went on too long and should have probably been wrapped up after maybe two or three, Uh, starting with Mr. H? Oh, Christ. Um, Well, I mean, you got two two that would work very nicely on there would be Alien, because they've just descended into chaos, but then also Terminator. I mean, we're looking at the sixth Terminator film coming out, which is doing what everything is... Well, it's moving into what movie theatres are doing, well, you know, movie as a uh, industry is, is doing nowadays is, we're not doing reboots, we're just going, ah, forget everything else happened, this one left off, this one leaves off from what you did enjoy. So it's a good one, it's a good one. It's not a reboot. This is going to be a good one. So Alien or Terminator, and I really hate to say that, but if you're thinking about the quantity that has been put into those franchises and the, and the good versus the bad, it's Alien uh, Alien and Terminator, not Predator, sorry. Um, it would be those two, unfortunately. Rossitron, do you agree Alien and Terminator have been letting down the side? Oh, I mean, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, Terminator <laughs> should have stopped after two, liked a bit of Terminator 3. Um, 
I actually, just to throw another one in, although I think this might be semi-controversial, is Rambo. I don't oh, think... Uh, yeah. I don't really like Rambo 2 that much. and Or First Blood Part 2, whatever. And I think Rambo 3 is terrible. But I kind of liked Rambo 4, in a way. Um, so I'm not sure, but now I hear that Rambo 5 is happening. <laughs> and I'm just like... Oh, it just feels <sighs> too much. Like Stallone seeing him as like an old man patient in creed was brilliant that makes sense to me but then going back to do another rambo film after four kind of ended it well just seems like too much to me and it by all accounts he's taking on mexican drug gangs which just sounds like (laughs) donald trump's wet dream incorporated into a movie i expect better from you stallone Um, yeah ryan what what do you think are there any franchises that yeah, I agree exactly with that. I, I, I have this kind of the really aggressive response to the whole Rambo thing is that I don't think Rambo has any right to be the action figure that everyone seems to make him out to be. So <laughs> I, 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 it actually was only quite recently did I actually see any of the, the, the Rambo films because like, like every, like I have friends who are like really into them. And I, I, I will, I will say I have not actually seen a Rocky film before either. So, or, oh, it's it's like, it's like when you hear so much about it, you kind of have that sort of spitefulness where it's like, I kind of now refuse to watch it just so I feel like the all one out. So I don't want to be like some sort of contrarian asshole about it. But <laughs> I watched, so I actually read David Morrell's book, First First Blood, before I'd ever seen any of the films. And so I'd only knew Rambo as what, the, you know, the sequels had made him out to be. And the thing about the, the first one is even, like, is that it, it kind of, like, Debbie Ferry, it kind of, it waters down what the book is whereas the book is more morally gray it's all about kind of post-traumatic stress disorder and sort of the 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 reaction to a a vietnam like a a vietnam veteran and sort of never judge a book by its cover was actually the the literal theme of it and when you watch when i watched first blood um i was surprised how subdued it was it it was it was action thriller it never felt like you know, I never, I never got the 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 whole uh, the image that the, again, like the sort of the pop culture image where he's like, you know, running around with a machete and, and, a, and a an RPG blowing up camps and stuff like that. It 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 felt like a guy who was very uh, disturbed, someone who was like, who was very very troubled and has gone through the stresses of war and stuff. And that I think it, it kind of caught me off guard because I I didn't I I thought that the mo- the 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 movies had butchered the book that much, but I felt like they yeah, had the first film that kind of got that. But then all the sequels that followed just felt like they completely missed the point and wanted to make him into this Hollywood's uh, version of of a character that is, you know, to be Not fair, been done to death. To be. Exactly. Yeah, I think the character of John Rambo was yeah. meant to commit suicide at the end of the first film. Um, so yeah. Yeah, they, they really a... dragged it out. Yeah, he's not a he's not a meant to be this romanticized troubled hero. He is supposed to be just like a really really broken broken you know like it was, it was like he's very heavily bearded in the book as well, and you don't see much of his you don't like it doesn't give you a lot of description on his face. So it's just weird when you see when you read the book, it just changed it just changed my it going in with that mindset, then seeing the films, it's sort of I had a very skewed perception on this series. Yeah, and and Oliver, you. What, what do you think? Which well, franchise do you think should have ended a long time ago? Well, I, I share that you know the views of the other guys, but you know with Terminator and um, and what was the other one? Aliens, Aliens as well. But it's, uh, but if you look back at you know during the eighties and into the early nineties, I think one series that always stu- stood out to me was Death Wish because they made five <laughs> Ooh, yeah. of them, right? So you had this <laughs> one movie that was successful in the seventies, and other, you know Canon films got obviously got the rights and did Death Wish 2, 3 and 4 and they just number 2 was this horrible mean nasty movie and number 3 just was comical where it's, it's one of the one of the best guilty pleasures Death Wish 3 we've seen a bunch of this old pensioner just taking out hooligans you know and then, and then he, he does you know, 4 and 5 and he's just like getting so old by that point it's just like an OAP on the rampage and it was just laughable and it was obviously you know when Canon went bust and Menachem bought um, you know at his own company, 21st Century Films, and did Death Wish 5. And it was just like, by that point, it was just really milking it to the death. And it obviously bombed. I think most of them kind of didn't do very well. I think any Death Wish, I think Death Wish 2 and 3 did okay, but 4 and 5 were just were embarrassing. But um, but yeah, it's, yeah, I would I would say probably Death Wish series was kind of the ones where they milked it back in the past. But I think over time, it's, it's become evident that really so the Rambos and the Terminators and the Aliens have all kind of gone on. Because we all... 
go see them anyway because we're all hoping for that next one movie <laughs> to be amazing. And yeah. uh, we, we are going to be like with, with Terminator. When the next one comes out, we'll be all saying to ourselves, oh, James Cameron's involved. It's going to be amazing. It's like, no, 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 no. It was James Cameron <laughs> who was saying, oh, you know, there's no more after Terminator 2, whatever. He's, he said, these ones are not canon, whatever. These ones aren't part of the, you know, the series, even though he goes out there and says, oh, you know, Terminator 3 is good and Genesis is good because he's friends oh. with the world. How he's could not, he lie to us like that? Well, he's not. He's, <laughs> not, he's not going to insult his friend, is it? Because it's like George. It's like Spielberg. He won't say anything bad against Lucas because they're friends. You know what I mean? You, yeah. as, you know, you wouldn't go out there and do it publicly. So, pro- yeah. As the other guys, I agree with them whole, wholeheartedly. But looking back, I'd probably say Death Wish. Fair enough. Mm. Another classic trope of the action genre is the ridiculous names that our heroes are called. <laughs> whether it's Marion Cobra Cabretti. In Cobra, Storm Mason, whatever generic Steven Seagal character that was. Uh, I think Chuck Norris is a character called Frank Shatter at some point. <laughs> so let's go around the table. The most ridiculous action hero names that you either just love or it's like that they, they, they went too far. They went too far with John Spartan, for example. Um, so let's start with uh, you, Ryan. Best action oh. hero name. Okay, kind of like the kind of like the um, one-liners. Like I'm, I'm always trying to I'm always trying to find the more subtle one because I always quite like I just kind of like how satisfying it is to say Axel Foley from Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> um, just because it it's kind of Axel Foley. Yeah, there's just it's it just sort of like fit it again. So that, that that film was nominated, I think, for original screenplay at the Oscars, wasn't it? Um, and what was it just sort of fits his his character it just describes his character in a nutshell it's like there's some sort of like witty smart assness to it could you say yeah. uh there's just it just kind of like rolls off the tongue in a way so i'm gonna kind of go with that one axel foley for ryan oliver what, what about you i'm going with john matrix because you know i just it makes me laugh when you just you know if that guy's passport has mr matrix and i just that that would just be that's the best oh i, I would happily change my name to surname to matrix that'd be fun you know, yeah. or change the first name to Axel, Axel Matrix. That'd be amazing. That'd be great. It's <laughs> the most manliest name of all time. <laughs> yeah. Mr. H, what do you reckon? Oh, I like the 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 kind of comical factor of Dutch Schaefer, a man with a very <laughs> clear, thick Austrian accent being called Dutch. I think that's just hilarious. So, yeah, Dutch Schaefer. I love it. And uh, Rossitron? Well, I'm shocked we've gotten this far and no one has said Snake Pliskin. No, I was not here, but I was hoping someone else would say it. That is just no. the best name. I mean, it's awful in a way, but it's so fucking good. And that character in that movie, it just works so brilliantly. It does, it does. Brilliant. Okay, so along with a ridiculous action hero name, you often have a ridiculous action film where credibility is pushed to the limits. I mean, for me, Commando generally comes to mind when you think about credibility being pushed to the limits but what do you guys think starting with rossitron oh man um i I could go big and say the running man i thought you could say big the tom hanks film and that is very (laughs) i saw Um, a different version of that i think (laughs) well yeah i'm gonna go with the running man just because the i mean if you've read the book it's they took it so far over what that book is and this kind of more subversive dystopian idea into which the film is, but also just the color and the, you know, the various villains that come out and their implements they use and the weird friggin' tracksuit things that they wear. <laughs> uh, the fact that it's Schwarzenegger at his most, but it's based on a Stephen King book, just it, that to me is ridiculous that you can say Schwarzenegger led a Stephen King adaptation, but it exists. So I'm going to say that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. H, what, which film pushes the strains of credibility for you? Uh, well, from its inception, it would actually be Predator because it, it started out as a joke, a complete joke of who Rocky would fight next, E.T. And <laughs> the whole thing was a complete joke. So I think that encapsulates, you know, a, a, the, the worst credibility for a, uh, for a film ever, but, you know, turned out to be one of the best. So, yeah. Uh, and Oliver? Well, I, in 1985, you had... It's probably the year of the most ridiculous action movies. Cause you had Death Wish 3, Invasion, U- Invasion USA, Jim Catter, Missing in Action 2, First Blood Part 2, and Commando. 
It's like come on, it's like the best year of this just nonsense, but great nonsense. <laughs> but so I, I don't know. It, it, it have to be Death Wish three, you know, because it's just so over the top and silly, and it's just it was a terrible plot, but with this amazing kind of over the top action, and just seeing this and say it was that great scene where he's, uh, Charles Bronson's got that massive machine gun just mowing down all these punks. It's great. I genuinely thought you were going to go for Jim Carter there. The know, skill of know, gymnastics, yeah, the kill like, of karate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan, what about you? Is it going to be uh, Jim Carter? Could we get a vote for Jim Carter? <laughs> no, I, okay, so I'm, I'm, try, I was, I'm trying to avoid saying what everyone else has already said. And I kind of was thinking, uh, so RoboCop, when I saw RoboCop when I was a kid, and it horrified me, the scene where it's like they put the gun down and it doesn't work out and then he gets blasted. And that <laughs> I... I refused to ever watch the film, I think, after that because it left me so traumatized. Then I did see it again. And I was like, the movie was just this really grim, horrible, like Judge Dredd like kind of setting. And then and then there I just I was thinking about it there and I thought, but then there's a scene where like a guy gets covered in toxic waste and then he emerges as sort of like a mutant thing, and then there's like this and crazy uh, sniper rifle. And I just and I thought, well that, that at that point I thought that's when it lost that sort of uh, edginess factor to it and became I think it was Ray Wise that made it so ridiculous in some way um, so yeah that's that, is that a valid response I don't know how, how everyone else feels about that one I mean it's a valid response whether people agree with you or not it's a completely different thing but I can see where you're coming from um, but villains Ray Wise is a villain this is a, a subject that's close to my heart I just finished writing a book all about where I interviewed the actors that played some of these great movie villains, your Vernon Wells, your Ronnie Coxes, um, even uh, Paul McCrane, who plays uh, the character in Robocop who gets melted. Um, so if we go around the table and talk to you guys and find out when it comes to the best villains that have stood up to the <laughs> likes of Arnie and Stallone and Willis, who immediately comes to mind? Oliver, let's kick things off with you. See, so I could go, yeah, say, because I've already mentioned Commando before, we could, could say with Bennett, we you know, because he's so funny. He's at the end, he's like, I don't need no gun! And, uh, but there's <laughs> the bit, I think for me, what sums up when growing up was watching his action movies and his actors. I think Frank Langella, a skeletal in Masters oh, of the Universe. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. He, he, he steals that movie despite the ridiculous premise. He's treating it like it's theatre, you know. And uh, and at the end, he turns like full-on solid gold, you know, that suit, like proper disco <laughs> mode. It's amazing. It's so... Uh, and Dolph Lundgren's like, he's got no... Because he's you know, at that point, his acting was, you know, you know, pretty weak at that point. But... So Frank Nigella gets all the lines and steals them all, and it's amazing. So yeah, I, I yeah, Skeletor for me. Skeletor, Ryan, is it another Frank Langella vote from his memorable appearance in Cutthroat Island, per chance, or uh, maybe a, a, a bit different? Um, <laughs> I, I tried to avoid bringing this movie up because it is my favorite action film, which is, and it would be Hans Gruber from Die Hard. Of um... course, cool. like I, I feel, like I understand that feels like the generic answer, but like it's. I just don't feel like there's there's just a villain that's sort of it, it. He's so serious and determined and and like you know so so there's something again partially haunting about him and then yeah weirdly he's something also there's always something so lovable about him as well like he's 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 charismatic in a very a very subdued charisma where I'm kind of like yeah I, I see your point I I, I get on that at the same time I would not piss the guy off in any means. So yeah, and for for that to be um, oh his name his name has slipped my mind. Uh, his first his Alan first, Rickman. first Alan Rickman's first uh, f- screen performance, I believe. Like you know, talk about hitting the ground running. <clears throat> and Mr. Ross Atron, what would your suggestion be? That was my terrible <laughs> Alan Rickman. I was. It took me a second to get what was going on there. Um, <laughs> I guess yeah, tough. You know, I could go for weirdly all the alien kind of characters that appeared at that time and silent killer types but i'm gonna go for yeah i'm gonna go for the terminator like i know he became a hero but in that first movie that kind of really just really horrifying unstoppable machine that was represented by you know it's the most the, the strongest man in the world at one point one of the only people who'd won at that you know miss universe I don't know how many times and getting very few lines, but the lines that he does get, like I'll be back 
are just so mm. killer. And then what comes after that, like the destruction of the entire police station, is just, <laughs> it's amazing. And he was kind of horrifying as a kid. Like, that's why I like Terminator 1 so much and why I don't really like the sequels as much, because he's just such a good bad guy. And Mr. H, wrapping things up, your best movie villain. Uh, well, you've all chosen the ones which I had shortlisted, so thanks, <laughs> I guess. Um, I'll, I'll choose someone a little bit out there then, uh, and I'll actually go Dylan from Predator, because you guys have chosen the other ones. So I'll, I'll choose a more subdued, deceptive, devious villain. So, you know, Dylan, I think, to be honest. He's... Is, is it Dylan's fault? I mean, the CIA did have him pushing too many pencils. Yeah, exa- I mean, look, you know, <laughs> his, his biceps were still bulging, but those pencils... <laughs> crazy cool so the coming up to the end now just a couple more rounds to go music is a crucial part whether it's brad fidel's iconic terminator theme tune jerry goldsmith's brass anthem for rambo or even the power anthems like we fight for love by power station at the end of commando what iconic 80s score or it can be power ballad song you know eye of the tiger sums (laughs) up classic 80s action films for you uh starting with mr h uh it's gotta be and i love this I, it's one of my favorite songs push it to the limits this is it's <laughs> you, you can't you can't not like that song you absolutely can't it's the best i absolutely love it so yeah uh, push it to the limits <laughs> rossitron oh uh, well it's tough because that was my choice <laughs> <laughs> I would say, if I was going to go score, then for me, I mean, it's anything Basil Polidorus, but Conan, like what that guy did with that Mm, is still to this day the ultimate fantasy score for me. Like, you can keep Lord of the Rings. It's amazing. And I'm going to say A View to a Kill for a power ballad by Duran Duran. No, that's good. Because it represents (laughs) everything of that era. Great choice. Ryan? Uh, I'm always going to sit on the Terminator one. Uh, I think it's like it's just the build up uh it's kind of like there's something partially like hopeful and inspiring but also something kind of uh poignant about it as well i just think it kind of encapsulates that that series altogether and the romantic version when they're having sex as well (laughs) (laughs) there's nothing like a sexy terminator theme to (laughs) to light the passion within you um and Oliver, what do you reckon? I suppose, you know, as I think Ross Chon may have mentioned it earlier with the sort of uh, burning in the third degree, or maybe uh, Ryan did, but it was that was probably the song that I would say as one from the 80s, but I think with the soundtrack, it was it would, it would probably be for me like Joey Goldsmith with First Blood. It's just one of the greatest scores for that point. And, um, you know, he kind of kept those themes going, you know, with with the sequels and when they did the fourth one they brought the music back and it just worked so well that's one of the great things about those 80s movies when they are brought back with, with sequels they often try to bring back the theme tune but m- the rest of the score is often a bit a bit drab with these new composers taking over but um yeah jerry goldsmith and first blood for me yeah i think brian tyler did the music for the last rambo film and essentially it was just one big jerry goldsmith homage which i i, I can't argue with the guy i did yeah. have i did have another one on my list which was uh, john debney's sudden death score for that the van damme movie it's one yeah. of my favorite sites but that's, that's a 90s movie so it's all 80s tonight and in terms of like 80s directors obviously we've talked a lot about films like terminator and predator so I think two names I think are going to come up a lot in this round are John McTiernan and James Cameron. But the directors that you feel had the most significant impact on the genre and the decade really as a whole. I mean, uh, we might kind of go around in circles on this as everyone just praises these two directors, but I could be wrong. I mean, let's start with you, Ryan. Is there a kind of like a, a director that for you just kind of encapsulated the decade and just moved it on in a way that no one ever thought possible okay so i guess everyone's gonna say yeah as you said john mctiernan or james cameron uh as they are the two that i have written down but um uh, as i'm assuming i'm sure more people will have to add to those two i i will try and uh throw another name in the pot which i understand like he, again he's predominantly known for for horror movies and i wouldn't even say he's necessarily the, the strongest filmmaker but I always thought that John, uh, John Carpenter at least always tried to bring something partially different. Um, I know with, uh, what do you call it when he did They, they, they Live and uh, Escape from New York, um, I think at least he tried to kind of create something with scale, like something with scale, but again, keep it rather intimate at the same time. And 
may not have uh, pushed it maybe at the same the same depth or even in some cases originality as, as what James Cameron did with something like Terminator or John Mc, uh, John McTiernan with Die Hard or Predator. But um, uh, I always feel like he's someone that sometimes gets a lot of a lot of flack, but uh, I feel like he's he, he does try to make every movie he makes in somewhat different. That's that's a that's a good choice. I, I I'd agree. I'm a big John Carpenter fan myself. Oliver, what what do you reckon? Um, I I would there's two there's two guys who were like really good at the spectacle. I think that was Richard Donner and John McTiernan because when they because John McTiernan obviously didn't have Blue Predator, but when he went onto Cinema Scope with things like Die Hard, you saw how we could really frame those action sequences like Donner can with you know we obviously come from Superman and The Omen, but when he did Lethal Weapon series, it would just when you, when there's a massive explosion, he always kind of shoots it so well. But one director I think made the biggest impact for me in terms of getting the violence across was Paul Verhoeven with with things like Robocop and Total Recall because Total Recall's nineteen ninety, so you know, I'm pushing it a little bit. But mm-hmm. seeing that seeing that seeing those people getting gunned down and like it was everything was so intense. The camera's really close and it captures everything though. And it's just the editing as well was just so so precise. It was just really shocking violence. But with Robocop you've got this kind of huge satire surrounding it. So it kind of often borders into sort of the comic realm. Um, but I think Paul Verhoeven really kind of um, shook things up a bit with action. And uh, Rossitron. Yeah, well, I'm uh, again, all the guys I would have said have come out, but I'm going to go a little bit different, I guess, and say that some of the directors that had the most, you know, impression on the, the directors that came after the 80s for me didn't come from America. But it was guys like John Woo and Jackie Chan, like what mm-hmm. they were doing. You know, the if you look at the martial arts stuff, like Armor of God, Project A, that Chan was doing, it has influenced so many people. And obviously John Woo, I mean, at the time he was doing Better Tomorrow and Bullet to the Head and The Killer. Like those are some of the greatest action films ever made, especially in terms of set pieces. And what that has done for action cinema, it almost in a way helped kill off a lot of the action movies we're talking about today and was adopted by American audiences after that. But they were just such good, precise, controlled movies that, and what they've been able to create was, I can't knock any of that. And uh, Mr. H, what, what do you say? Which director made the biggest impact on you? Ugh. Guys, the worst being last, because everyone just <laughs> picks everything. Um, I mean, I've had to... I'm, I'm at the bo- bottom of the barrel here. Um, Don't say John McTiernan. <laughs> no, 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 I've chosen. I'm, I'm completely left field. But no one's actually said Steven Spielberg. And oh, uh, okay. Indiana okay. Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark was yeah. in 81. And that's a fantastic film. Mm. But some of the things which were done in that is, you know, it, it is, is incredible. I mean, you guys chose and, and you know, we, we touched on James Cameron. James Cameron's influence in the industry speaks for itself disregarding what he's doing now in his submarine but <laughs> steven spielberg also you know did some absolutely monumental stuff so uh, because everyone else is chosen I, I have to go to steven spielberg i'm afraid i suppose there's one I director think... there's one director i suppose we haven't mentioned but people may forget maybe like john glenn because like the bond films of the 80s so oh, it's really? a really impressive action scenes like license to kill we see that petrol tanker yeah. go off and explode it's incredible <laughs> so yeah that's influential that's yeah that was a that was a good thing to end on steven spielberg young up and comer i think he's got a promising career ahead of him look forward <laughs> to see what he does next <laughs> um last year i i did something in bristol called genre get in action and it was like a 12 hour uh action movie marathon and i got to show some uh action films that i feel don't get enough love and uh, in the lineup was uh, Carl Weathers' Action Jackson and also Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee's Showdown in Little Tokyo, which are two action films that I love that I don't feel enough people talk about. Uh, but for you guys, as this is the final round before we wrap up tonight, is there an action film that you would like to tell people to seek out and that you don't feel um, many people appreciate, starting with you, Rustron? Oh, um yeah, <laughs> there's a few, but I'll I'll try and stick to one. So I'm not taking too many of what people are saying. I'm actually quite a big fan in terms of it just being a bit of a different movie of Red Scorpion from oh, 1989. Oh, I was thinking of yeah. that. Oh, <laughs> it's it's kind of the quintessential Dolph movie in a way, 
where he is he's basically topless for like most of the movie and he is just holding these gigantic guns but it's in just a location that you didn't really see very much at that time and looking at a culture i mean it's still got the problems that 80s had in terms of looking at other cultures but they tried to do it i feel slightly with a better eye towards looking at that culture and also it's a half decent action movie that doesn't really get talked about at all great mr h uh well i i would say and it doesn't get that much love you know in this day and age especially from you know a, a younger audience but go out and watch conan the, the barbarian you know, I have a lot of uh, younger audience on my on my channel, and it's something which they absolutely wouldn't have watched. Um, and for them, really? yeah, I, I, oh, honestly, some of the stuff I review and not hate you, because this is going to be released on my channel. So just real quick, I love you guys. Um, but yeah, <laughs> some of the things that we're going. That guy's the voice of Darth Vader right there. That Jin's <laughs> all Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It does shock me. So I, I would say go out and watch it because it, you know, it's a bit of fun, um, and it, it kind of puts Arnold Schwarzenegger in perspective from you know what what he used to do to what he does now. And uh, yeah, I just I just think they should. So great pick, Oliver. How about you? See, I I put a film from the nineties, and it's got to be from the eighties, doesn't it? Can I do one from the nineties? Probably not. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll allow it this one time, Oliver. Okay, but okay. Because I, I yeah, because the other ones I thought <laughs> were Dolph movies, and they were like nineteen ninety, but I. As I mentioned earlier with uh, the soundtrack, one that didn't quite make it in was Sudden Death, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, which is one of the finest diehard clones uh, where Van Damme doesn't do much fighting in it. You know, he's playing a actually more of a dramatic kind of role. And um, it's the one time I thought where Van Damme actually was doing some good acting in that, I was really... Because with most, as with James Cameron, he gets the best out of Arnold and Peter Himes, or Peter Hames, how you like to pronounce it, he got the best out of Van Damme with Time Cop and Sudden Death. And Sun Death is really the one I sort of go back to a lot because because it was obviously the other performances got a great villain as well and and having this diehard style thing in this kind of ice hockey rink and the whole thing you know all explodes at the end and Van Damme beating up this person dressed as a giant penguin uh, is great so I would say anyone out there who's not seen Sudden Death you need to go watch it because it's superb. It's a fantastic film. I, I'm a big big fan of sudden death and it's such shame powers booth died last year yeah he was yeah. wonderful ryan wrapping things up oh, an underrated uh, action film that people need to seek out no pressure then i was actually trying to think of one from uh i'm from northern ireland so i was actually trying to think of one from uh my island uh and i, I thought of a film called uh traffin which is a it's a pierce brosnan film and i remember it, it's it's one of those ones where it's like i you know it's irish when a car chase get uh, a car chase gets abruptly stopped when they get stuck behind a tractor um but then uh, the more then i went then I, I i i youtubed it just to make sure i could remember it and then uh, i very quickly remembered why nobody uh, remembers it <laughs> Uh, but if you want, like, really schlocky, terrible, bad acting from Brosnan and stuff, that's the one to go. But to give my actual answer that I do recommend, uh, it's a film called Straight to Hell, um, which is like a... It's a it's like a sort of a really bizarre par parody on uh, spaghetti westerns in a way where it's not really a western but it, in fact it actually feels more like a Mad Max uh, movie at times where it's like these three criminals and they, uh, they're trying to escape to Mexico, their car breaks down and then they end up in this town where... It's uh, all the all the people that live there are like these cowboys that have like coffee addictions, and uh, they all had sort of like they're carrying espresso machines and stuff around with them. And then all this chaos ensues, and it's just mad, incoherent nonsense. Uh, it's just shootout after shootout. Uh, but at the same time, fun characters. Uh, there's there's a it's a it's obviously a, a comedy, and then there's um some actual a bit of emotional depth to it add some sort of uh, substance if you want it uh but yeah if you if you really want to push a really bizarre strange action movie that's the one i would go to guys this has been an awesome dive into the action genre before we wrap up let's just quickly go around the table and tell people where they can find you uh both on youtube and on social media mr h uh, you can find me at Mr. H Reviews on Twitter and, bizarrely enough, Instagram, but of course, uh, YouTube, just Mr. H Reviews. And Rossitron? Uh, yeah, just Rossitron on YouTube, and Ross Peacock is my Twitter, because that's my actual name, surprisingly, not Rossitron. So, thank you. Gosh, the mask <laughs> falls away. <laughs> Oh Ryan Hollinger, where can people find you? Uh, YouTube.com slash Ryan Hollinger or on Twitter.com slash Ryan Hollinger. Convenient to have a name like that. Uh, 
And finally, Oliver. We just put in Oliver Harper into YouTube and you'll find me and my silly mug. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm uh, Ty Singh. You can find me on Twitter at Time and Singh and go to Bristol Bad Film Club to see what terrible films I show per month to uh, raise money for local charities. But guys, thank you very much for doing this. This has been wonderful. And uh, everyone go to Kickstarter and back Oliver's project in search of the last action heroes. And we'll hope to bring you some of the greatest action legends uh, in this film and give you the stories behind some of your favorite action films.